us sing this together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moon. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Sing when I fight.
You know, we have been taking a deep dive into this look at Ephesians 6, and I've enjoyed the study. And um, there's just two more pieces of armor to look at. And my goal in this is to keep it simple. Keep it into something that we can use, something that I can put into my life. And I've actually been a little surprised by the journey. And I've looked at the passage for years, and today, and in just these last few months or uh, weeks, it has been taking a little different life for me, and I appreciate the Lord helping me with that. He's kind of made it fresh. So today I'm going to start with Ephesians verse 13, where it says, 613. It says, therefore, put on the whole armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith 
with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, our Word tells us, put on the whole armor of God. And how do you do that? I've seen that this is something that's not optional. We're in a battle that's not going away. It's something that we have to learn. We have to get a grasp on what he's trying to tell us. And putting on the belt of truth, simply, is about developing a true relationship with the way, the truth, and life. It's about developing friendship. It's about learning to listen to him. It's about learning to love him. It's learning to walk with him. It's a relationship. And at the core of this spiritual battle are people who have a genuine, real, authentic, true relationship with Jesus Christ. The breastplate of righteousness follows that. Because the best prayer of righteousness is about passionately and persistently seeking his plan. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And if you have a friendship with him, and if you have a real relationship with him, the desire to seek his plan would be natural. It follows. Third, he says, go on the sandals of peace. The sandals of peace are getting rooted and is about getting rooted in the knowledge that I am whole, that I am complete, that I am perfect in Christ. The enemy likes to tell us that we're flawed, that we have insufficient funds, that we're not good enough, and all those kinds of things. But the peace of God says right here and now, I'm whole, I'm perfect, I'm complete. And that's not just a temporary state, that's an eternal state. I'm that way, peace of God, it's good stuff, it makes me feel good. And then he tells us to put on the shield of faith. The shield of faith that we talked about last week is a choice. It's a choice to believe. It's a choice to believe I'm loved. It's a choice to believe that he's with me. And it's a choice to believe that he is in control of my circumstances. And sometimes the battle gets heavy and sometimes the arrows rain down and, some, and there's going to be adversity, there's going to be problems, there's going to be all of that. And God says sometimes, you have to choose. Sometimes you just have to make a firm stand. Sometimes you just have to decide to believe. So today we come to hope. Now, hope is essential. It's essential to standing strong. It's absolutely essential to overcoming evil. It's absolutely essential to walking in the plan of God. And it's absolutely essential in becoming the person that God's called you to be. Now, you know, we talk about spiritual warfare and all these kind of corresponding topics. And, you know, we talk about wrestling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And we go, ooh, oh, that's heady stuff. That's highly spiritual, you know, man, let's dig into that. But who wants to talk about perseverance or patience or endurance? Because that's what hope does. Hope creates perseverance. It creates this mindset that I'm going to keep trusting him. See, regardless of your faith level, and regardless of how much you know about the Bible, and regardless of your tradition, and regardless of how much you have in your bank, and regardless of your education level, let me tell you something that's absolutely true from the Word of God. Without perseverance, you cannot win. And the other thing is also truth. True. It's with perseverance, you cannot lose. The secret to overcoming is having this gritty mindset that determines regardless of the battle, regardless of the enemy, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the adversity, and regardless of the hopelessness of that day, perseverance and hope says, I'm determined to keep on. I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on walking. I'm going to keep on fighting. I'm going to keep on keeping on. Amen. That's perseverance. That's grit. And you can't lose when you have that kind of attitude. So, so what is hope? And in the simplest definition of hope, it's about looking forward. That's what it is. You know, um, I've been around some really good coaches. 
And I have found that the really good ones have a strategy that's going to help you deal and help you overcome when you're facing a really tough opponent. Now, now, so it happens. The real coaches know how to help you handle adversity. And one of the things that you'll hear them say all of the time is one of the greatest skills in any sport to rise to the next level, you have got to be able to forget your latest failure. You have to take your eyes off the scorecard or the scoreboard. And what you have to do is concentrate. You've got to look forward. You've got to concentrate on the next move. You've got to concentrate on the next pitch. Or you've got to concentrate on the next encounter. It's about moving forward. It's about looking forward. It's about forgetting that and moving toward that. That's hope. That's what champions do. Now, you know I'm all... I'm all a great big fan of Hallmark movies. <laughs> How unpredictable they are. <laughs> you never know what's coming. Okay, that final kiss could be like one minute and 15 seconds before the show ends, or it could be at one minute and five seconds. It's right in there somewhere. But that's, and so, so you know me, I'm a fan of man movies. Because man movies are totally unpredictable as well. <laughs> you know, it looks hopeless. The bad guys are going to take over the world. Okay, you know how it works. And then some hero gives this amazing speech, and the battle turns. You know, I see that scene of William Wallace and Braveheart, you know, where they're looking, he has these ragtag group of commoners and they're facing that, you know, um, a sort of unsurmountable English army with all their tools and all their weapons. And he rides out front and says, well, I am William Wallace. And I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of the tyranny. Oh, I hear that kind of stuff. I just want to go home and watch it. I get chills. Or oh, one of my other favorite ones is the one on Independence Day, President Whitmore. You know, the aliens have destroyed all these major cities and they've kind of come up with this kind of hopeless plan. He stands up and he says, good morning. In less than an hour, aircraft from here will be joining others all around the world and you will be launching the largest aerial battle of all time. Man. I just, you know, when I was getting ready to go out to play football games, they had a special cheer just for me. Ricky, Ricky, he's our man. If he can't do it, we're not surprised. <laughs> rah, rah, re, kick him in the knee. Rah, rah, ras, kick him in the other knee. <laughs> Get, okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but you know, there were some coaches have a way of just making you want to run through a wall. You know what, I, I am a favorite. I, I love World War II history. And during the very darkest days of World War II in early late 1940 and early 1941, <clears throat> Hitler had already blitzkrieged his way all the way through Western Europe. And at that time, um, every Western democracy in Europe was under the rule of the Third Reich, except one, and that was Britain. The Russians had signed a non-aggression pact, saying that they would not fight. And the United States, FDR, had campaigned on this idea that he would not send our, our sons to war in Europe. The Luftwaffe was bombing England nightly, and German troops were amassing at Port Calais, preparing for an invasion into Great Britain hopelessly outnumbered and woefully unprepared, Britain stood alone against the Third Reich. And during that darkest night, when many British leaders were telling Churchill to capitulate, they were telling him to deal with it, to do the terms, to surrender, Churchill took to the microphone and he spoke to the nation. You know, when I read these, when I've read these words, I thought, man, that's got to be the most inspiring speech ever. But when you hear it, but I saw a clip of it, when you see it, he's got no rah-rah. He's got no emotion. He just says, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight in the beaches, 
We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight on the hills. We shall never surrender. Didn't sound like much, but it gave hope. It imparted hope. It turned the destiny of the world. Something began to turn after that speech. Now, the apostle Paul himself, he was a man who knew the secret to standing strong. Every tool that hell had, every attack, every strategy, it had all been, had just, he just rained on him. He knew about what was happening. He was stoned, he was hounded, he was persecuted. You know the stories. Uh, he suffered shipwreck, he suffered want in the knee, and through all of that, and through all of that adversity, and through all of that struggle, and through all of that, <clears throat> through all of his life, to, 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 to push the gospel forward, what was on his mind? How did he respond to it? And Philippians 3.13 says this. He says, I do have, this is from the Passion Translation, this is the heart of the man of God who's going to change the world. Who knows about the helmet of salvation? He says this. However, I do have one compelling focus. Here's what's on my mind. Here's what's in my heart. I forget all of the past and I fasten my heart to the future instead. Man, that's powerful. That's the attitude of the hope of salvation. It's forgetting what has passed and fastening my heart and my mind onto what's coming. See, there's a difference between faith and hope. Now, they are connected and they are similar, but it's about tense. Faith is present. Faith is right here and now. When Jesus talked to the, uh, you know, when Jesus was speaking, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, that's a reference to being right here and right now, he is right here and now. He is the resurrection and the life. Right here and right now, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Right here and right now, he is the great shepherd. Right here and right now, he is the light of the world. It's all present tense. And because of that, my faith says that right here and right now, I am completely saved, I am completely whole, I am completely forgiven, and I am right here and right now completely redeemed by the hand of God. Right here and right now, I am a child of God. Right here and right now, God's presence is here. Right here and right now, I am filled with, and so are you, the Holy Spirit. Wow, praise God for right here and right now. Amen. That's faith. Hope is about a confident expectation. It's a confidence in the future. I came across this quote by Gilbert Chesterton. It says this, to love means loving the unlovable. To forgive means pardoning the unpardonable. Faith means believing the unbelievable. And the hope means hoping when everything seems hopeless. Good words. So the reality is, <clears throat> how do I get that? How do I get that kind of hope? We, you know, we're living in a world right, that is rapidly losing hope. Jesus said in Luke 21, 26, he says, about the last days, he says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And Jesus asked another really pointed question in Luke 18, 8. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I saw this quote as well. This comes from, <laughs> I'm going to make this up, but I shouldn't tell you that. But His name was Dokoslewski. That's exactly how you pronounce it. He says this. He says, totally without hope, one cannot live. To live without hope is to cease to live. Hell is hopelessness. It's no accident that above the entrance to Dante's hell is this inscription. Leave behind all hope, ye who enter here. You know what's happening in our world? They push, they're systematically pushing faith away. 
It's seen as antiquated and it's irrational superstition that's not suitable for today's enlightened mind. But here's what's happened. As our culture pushes faith away, they're also pushing away the very the hope that they need. They're, they're, they're pushing away the very peace that they're longing for. They're pushing away the very grace that would change their lives. And the same is happening in the church world. We are struggling. We are battling those same demons. We're battling that hopelessness. So how do we get this kind of hope? This kind of hope that strengthens us. This kind of hope that gives us this refusal to quit, this refusal to surrender, this refusal to back down, this kind of attitude that's going to conquer hell. Well, in Luke 24, there's a powerful story about hope that I want us just to take a look at. It's one I think that you're all fairly familiar with. It says, in, in the context of the story, these are two disciples who had seen Jesus crucified. They were there. They experienced it. They were traumatized by it. And three days later, they are walking, the Bible talks about, on a road to Emmaus. And they're talking among themselves. And it says in verse 13, it says, now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, I love this piece, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Why? You think you've been walking in a rough road? You think you've been walking when it all is looking hopeless? When there's been failure, when there's been despair, when you don't, you're confused about what's happening? I'll tell you what, Jesus himself, even though you don't realize it, he's drawn near to you. He's going to walk with you through this whole thing. But here's what they didn't know. They didn't know it was him. See, part of, here's, here's where hope comes from. Hope comes from recognizing who he is. Jesus is our only hope. He's the only hope for mankind. There is no one. The only hope that mankind offers is temporary, partial, incomplete, and imperfect. Absolutely, actually everything that our world turns to and everything that our world is hoping in, every single thing, every single one of them is ultimately going to let them down. There is only one hope that will never let you down. There's only one hope that will never fail you. There's only one hope that will never disappoint you. There's only one hope that will sustain you. And there's only one hope that will give you strength to overcome evil. Amen. Amen. Be happy about that. That's good stuff. Baby. Yeah. Jesus Christ. He is the only, absolute, eternal, perfect, complete, never failing, unquenchable, undefeatable, absolute hope for every human. And without him, hope does not exist. So why then? Why is Jesus the only source of hope? And I want to pick up the story in verse 28. Now, Jesus has been talking with them. He's been teaching them. He, he was pointing them to the scripture. He was causing, and he was actually talking about himself. And it says in verse 28, he says, as they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. This is the Jesus who they haven't recognized yet. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their eyes. They asked each other, what are our hearts? He says, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up, they returned at once to Jerusalem they found the eleven, and those with them, they assembled together and saying, It 
is true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. That was the greatest hope. That was the greatest message. That was the most powerful message that they could ever proclaim is it's true. He has risen from the dead. Why is Jesus the only hope for us? Because it's true. He has risen from the dead. And wherever that message goes, and wherever that message is proclaimed, and wherever that message is believed, lives change. Chains fall off. Hell is conquered. The kingdom of God advances. It's that message. This was their hope. This was their message. This is what gave them strength. This is why they could keep fighting. This is why they would keep believing. This is why they kept praying. This is why they, could you imagine? Could you imagine? You know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, we hear about the resurrection. And, and, and yeah, that's a great truth. But could you imagine being there and seeing torture? Seeing the humiliation and seeing the pain and seeing his lifeless body come off the cross and then seeing his lifeless body put into a cave and a stone a little over time. And then three days later, be sitting at a table, eating with him, breaking bread with him, talking with him. What would that do to you? How would that hope change your life? Man, you'd be filled with joy. You'd be filled with power. You'd be strong. You would have that. I don't care what hell is on. It's all hell. Hell gave it its. See, see, that's what's happened with the resurrection. Death is the ultimate foe. Death is was the ultimate is the ultimate defeat. Death is what death is our greatest fear. And now they had a new hope. They had this hope. It is true. The Lord has risen. And everywhere, at every time, at every circumstance, when this message is proclaimed, hope breaks out. Life breaks out. See, we have. A living hope. The scripture says in 1 Peter 1 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by resurrection. It's a living hope. The, old, the resurrection is the ultimate victory over the ultimate foe. And it means that regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the battle, Regardless of the hopelessness, regardless of what we are looking at, we win. It also means that every believer who trusts in him, every believer who, uh, who embraces him and who believes in him, every believer is filled with and gifted with and infused with this uncreated, unconquerable, unchangeable, undeniable power of God, the resurrection life lives within us. And regardless of how the enemy tries to distort that, how he tries to destroy that, and how he tries to deceive us from that, the truth is, the resurrection life, the life that conquered death, hell, and grave, lives in us. And we have something to look forward to. Amen. 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 Hmm. See, it's with this hope alone that we can now wrestle with the principalities. We can stand firm against the spiritual powers. We can fight spiritual wickedness in high places and not with some expectation that maybe we'll win someday. The hope stands on the truth is that the resurrection means that this battle has already been won. These chains have already been broken. These captives have already been set free. The debt has already been paid. Christ the Lord has risen today. It is true, he's alive. And every promise he made, every, every truth that he proclaimed, it's all true because of the resurrection. And that means I can hope. I have a hope. He says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared. I have hope that no matter how bad it gets here, I've got a reason to keep believing. I've got a reason to keep fighting. I've got a reason to keep obeying. I've got a reason to keep believing, standing strong. I know we win. And God knows what it looks like. Now, Hebrews 11 is a story of the champions of faith. 
and, and it details really from, um, from Genesis really to, you know, Paul's dad, those great heroes and those great things that they did and those great victories that they overcome, those great deliverances that they saw. And sometimes their faith was simply about holding on. Sometimes they saw great adversity. Sometimes they saw torture. Sometimes they saw adversity that, that just, but you think, how does a person withstand? How does a person stay strong? It was because their hope was fixed. It was because they were looking not at the past, but they were looking forward. And Jesus himself practiced this. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 comes right after Hebrews chapter 11. I learned that because, you know, as you know, I have a 4.0. 1.0 in my freshman year, 1.0 in my sophomore year. So I, I pretty got this number of things figured out. But Hebrews chapter 12 is the summation, and this is the reason why Hebrews 11 was given to us. Why did God tell us about all these wonderful people of faith and their amazing victories? Let me read Hebrews chapter 12. And I'll start with verse 2. It says, this is from the Passion Translation. It says, we look away from the natural realm and focus our attention and our expectation. My future. My expectation. What's going to happen in the future? I'm focusing that on Jesus Christ, who birthed faith within us and leads us forward into life's perfection. King James says, looking unto Jesus. That's what gives you hope. Looking, uh, looking, <laughs> refusing to dwell over there, refusing to dwell on the past, refusing to just hide, refusing to just maintain. It's not about maintaining. It's not about just holding on. True hope says, I, I am believing and I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward with my eyes on him. And here, this is, this is the one, I think, one of the um, most humbling, profound verses in the entire Bible. And I'm reading it from Hebrews chapter, uh, from the Passion Translation. And it's talking about his example. His example is this. Jesus gave us an example of hope. Because his heart was set on the joy of knowing that you would be his. You know what the hope of Jesus was? That you would have a personal walk with him. That you would be with him. That you would be connected to him. That he could share his life with you. That he could be joined with you. That was his hope. That's what he was looking forward to. That was his dream. He wants to be with you. He wants to be close to you. He wants all these promises to come to pass in your life. He wants to give you a future and a dream and a hope. And here's what it says. Because his heart was set on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered the humiliation and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. That's why he did it. That's where he found his strength. That's where he found his determination. That's where he found his resolve. Knowing, looking ahead. Now, I don't know. And Ben, you can come up now. You know, when you get to be as old as I am, heaven starts to look a lot better. <laughs> but when you get to be as old as I am, you've got friends, and you got family, and you got a reason to keep believing. You got a reason to keep moving forward. You got a reason to keep fighting. You know, I love that old song that says, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look 
upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. What a day. What a glorious day. What a wonderful day that was. But you know what? I've got a mom. I've got grandmas. I've got some cousins. I've got some uncles. I've got some people. But I'm also waiting to see. I've got a reason to keep moving. Listen, faith is, this hope isn't about standing still. It's not about maintenance. Standing strong is not about just trying to stay in place. Oh, no, no, no. Standing strong means here's what I believe in. Here's what I'll fight for. Here's what I'm determined that I will not back down. It doesn't mean we're stationary. It means we're moving forward while we're standing in this grace. <clears throat> Listen, sometimes the hope is just simply a matter of recognizing, having your eyes opened, recognizing that he's with you. He's got you. You're right here in his hands. Your future is his. 